Thank you for joining us for this interactive Facebook Live event presented by Seitman Cancer Center based at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Seitman is an international leader in cancer treatment, research, prevention, and education. Ranked among the top cancer centers by U.S. News and World Report, Seitman also is one of only a few U.S. cancer centers to receive the highest rating of exceptional from the National Cancer Institute. Welcome to today's Facebook Live. Hello and welcome to our uh, show today. We are going to be discussing urologic cancers, therapies, and screenings. Uh, joining me is uh, Dr. Brian Bauman, an assistant professor of radiation oncology at uh, Washington University School of Medicine, who also treats uh, patients at Seidman Cancer Center. Dr. Bauman, I'd like, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be able to join uh, this Facebook Live uh, session. Very good. Now, we did want to point out that uh, we had another uh, expert who is going to be available also, Dr. Gerald Andriel, uh, the head of the urologic surgery at Washington University in Seidman. However, he was, uh, he was delayed uh, treating a patient and is no longer able to make it uh, to our discussion today. But I think that you and I will, will, uh, will move on anyway, and we have lots of good information to, uh, to share with folks. Um, so again, thank you for being here. Um, now, our discussion is about urological cancers, which of course affect men and women, um, some affecting just men and, and others affecting both. Maybe could you talk about some of the, the more common uh, urologic cancers that affect both genders? Sure. Yeah, so I think two of the most common urologic cancers that affect men and women would be bladder cancer, which is quite common. Uh, it's particularly common among smokers. Not many uh, folks know that um, bladder cancer is the cancer that is most strongly associated with smoking, even more so than lung cancer. Um, uh, kidney cancer uh, is another common cancer that uh, affects both men and women. Um, and then, of course, there are the, the cancers that affect uh, mostly men. Uh, prostate, prostate, probably. And testicular being, being the two main ones. And how common are those? So prostate cancer is very common. It's, it's one of the most common cancers uh, in men. It's one of the most common causes of, of cancer death in men. It's not as common as skin cancer, but it's, but it's very common. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about prostate cancer a little later. First, I'd like to remind our viewers that if you have any questions, please uh, put those into the comment section below uh, so that Dr. Bauman can answer them in a little bit. Um, now, First of all, I always think it's kind of helpful to let people know what the three traditional forms of, of uh, therapy are for, for cancer. And obviously, surgery is one that, you know, almost immediately pops to mind in people. And that's obviously Dr. Andriel's um, uh, expertise. And then there's chemotherapy, and that, of course, is the use of drugs um, to treat cancer. And then, of course, it's, there's your uh, area of expertise, and that's radiation uh, therapy. Could you tell us a little bit about, about that? But radiation, sure. So uh, radiation therapy is a, a very common, very safe, uh, very effective way of treating a whole variety of cancers, including urologic cancers. Um, radiation typically involves delivery of high-energy x-rays with precision to the cancer tumor. Um, and the way that radiation works is by damaging the DNA of the dividing cancer cells. And the damage caused to the dividing cancer cells' DNA prevents them from successfully dividing and, and causes the cancer cells to die. So radiation generally comes in, in two forms. Um, one is external beam radiation, which is what most people are familiar with. That's where we beam the radiation from the outside in. Again, it's like a high-energy X-ray machine that essentially does that. Um, and that's very commonly used for prostate and bladder cancers and even kidney cancer as well as testicular. The other form of radiation is internal radiation or what we call brachytherapy. And that's where we will actually place radioactive sources directly into the cancer and the radiation is emitted from the, from the inside out as opposed to from the outside in. Uh, and that is very commonly used as a great treatment for men with prostate cancer, but it's used for other diseases as well. And what are some of the benefits of uh, radiation therapy over other types of treatment? Well, I, I think it's careful to pick the right treatment for the, for the individual patient. So I don't think that, uh, that radiation is better than surgery. I think that it may be a preferred option over surgery or some other treatments uh, for appropriate patients. But I think there are other patients where um, surgery to remove the prostate, for example, is, is the preferred uh, treatment. So it really takes a multidisciplinary approach to try to 
you know, along with the patient, come up with what we think is the best treatment option for them and ultimately the one that they feel the most comfortable with. So multidisciplinary multidisciplinary care is bringing together each one of those different experts uh, along with the patient determining the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. Is that? Exactly. And I think carrying the patient along the way so that they feel comfortable with the decision that ultimately, you know, we have kind of a meeting of the minds, not just of each of the providers, but also uh, the patient so that, you know, um, they ultimately make a decision that they feel comfortable with and that we as doctors also feel comfortable with and can support. Very good. Well, um, we do have some reader submitted questions from earlier if you'd like to go ahead and, and answer sure. a couple of them now. Um, we have one from Verna who's asking, are you using any alternative methods of treatment? So, um, you know, in my practice, I don't use um, alternative methods of treatment. Um, I will, you know, um, often recommend that my patients who are on hormone therapy or androgen deprivation therapy for prostate cancer, that they take uh, this herbal supplement called black cohosh. Um, that's been, that can help reduce hot flashes. Um, I'm also a believer in the use of uh, Wisconsin ginseng, which was shown in a clinical trial by the Mayo Clinic to reduce uh, fatigue in cancer patients. And I think the results of that study are particularly interesting because it was a blinded study. So the patients didn't know if they were taking, if they were receiving the ginseng or if they were just getting the placebo pill and the group getting the ginseng reported less fatigue. Um, beyond that, I, I don't really uh, get to involve with alternative therapies and, um, but Very certainly good. there's, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm for them. Okay. Well, I appreciate you uh, being able to share with us what, what you do know about those two in particular. I guess the important thing is to, is to look for whether or not it's been peer-reviewed. Uh, what sort of research do you generally uh, suggest that people um, pay heed to? Um... Yeah, I think it's a great point about these alternative therapies. I think that, um, you know, in, at WashU and in, and in the sort of academic uh, cancer community, we really try to base our decisions as much as possible on, on evidence, and, and the best evidence comes from clinical trials. And I think that with a lot of these alternative therapies, there's a lack of data on their effectiveness. And in particular, there's often no head-to-head -head comparisons between the current standard of care. And the current standard of care became the current standard of care because it was better than what we were doing before. So I think to sort of leapfrog over that process of rigorously testing one treatment against another and determining if it's better or maybe even worse is really important. And so I, I wouldn't want patients to miss out on opportunities for curing their cancer by pursuing alternative therapies which may have some effectiveness but which may not be as effective as existing therapy. So I think it's certainly reasonable to think about combining some of those therapies with kind of standard Western approaches to treating cancer. Um, but I think that patients should really talk to their physicians about any potential interactions between those alternative therapies and the traditional therapy. Certainly you'd want to let your oncologist know if you're on at any other type of therapy, whether- Absolutely, very yeah. Good. Uh, we have a question here from Karen who's asking, if she has melanoma in her lymph nodes in her, in her groin area, is she going to get them in her bladder and other urologic areas? Well, I have to confess to not being an expert on melanoma, um, but I think that it's unlikely that the cancer would spread to the urologic organs um, if it's melanoma. But that being said, I think discussing that particular situation and her case with her oncologist would make the most sense. Okay, very good. Um, we have a one here from Lori who's asking, what are the initial signs of bladder cancer? So um, one of the most common initial signs of bladder cancer is, is painless bleeding. And so I think that, that any patient, particularly someone with a smoking history who experiences um, blood in the urine, especially if it occurs more than once, should see their doctor, should have the urine tested, and should undergo an appropriate workup. I have to say, I've, I've never heard of the link between smoking and bladder cancer before. Is it, I mean, is it, is it that strong of a link? Is it that common of, of, a, of an effect for years of smoking? It's very common, yeah, and, and this has sort of been very well documented. I think the thought is that um, the chemicals that enter the bloodstream during smoking, uh, many of them are excreted by the kidneys and end up in the bladder. And so year upon year, decade upon decade, um, smokers' bladders are essentially marinating in these carcinogens. 
and so bladder cancers can develop. And one of the challenging aspects of managing bladder cancer is that the cancer can come back in a different spot than where it originated. Because again, the entire bladder has been exposed to these chemicals and is at risk for developing a bladder tumor. Now, about 75% of bladder cancers are um, more superficial cancers, so they don't invade deep into the muscle. Thankfully, the bladder is a relatively straightforward organ. It has mucosa, it has muscle underlying the mucosa, um, and there's not a whole lot beyond that. So most cancers lie in the mucosal layer, but if the cancer does progress into the muscular layer, it's a much more serious cancer. And typically it can't be managed with just a simple excision and instilling of drug into the bladder. But that's when you think about doing a radical cystectomy, which is surgical removal of the bladder and lymph node dissection or uh, chemotherapy and radiation. Now, could you have bladder cancer and not know it? Is it could you be asymptomatic? So that's possible, but, but again, usually at some point symptoms are, are going to arise. But unfortunately, there are some patients where the first sign of symptoms um, are indicative of disease that is spread. So they have pain in the bone from bladder cancer that has spread. But usually we catch the disease before uh, it's it's spread that far. So certainly one more reason to consider quitting smoking if, if you oh, still yeah. are. Oh yeah, yeah. One more reason to consider quitting smoking for cool. sure. Um, we're kind of uh, we have a viewer who's asking if family history affects urologic cancer risk at all. So it can. Um, I think that's a very kind of fruitful area of research. Um, certainly, patients who have a family history, for instance, of prostate cancer, um, they may be at higher risk for prostate cancer. Um, my ears always perk up if I hear that, that a family member, particularly a father or a brother, um, not only has had prostate cancer but has developed metastatic prostate cancer or even have passed away from prostate cancer. I think in those patients I would feel less comfortable um, with active surveillance. It could still be an option, but I think that um, you know those are patients where I would favor more aggressive treatment. Could, could you explain active surveillance? Sure. So active surveillance um, is kind of a unique luxury that we have in, in the world of prostate cancer. There aren't too many cancers in oncology um, where for someone who's, who's otherwise pretty healthy, we can defer immediate treatment. Um, you know, it would be malpractice to do active surveillance on a lung cancer patient, for instance. But with prostate cancer, um, prostate cancer, especially if the PSA is relatively low, the patient doesn't have a large tumor burden as assessed on a digital rectal exam or an MRI, and the appearance of the prostate cancer cells under the microscope is not particularly aggressive, so a lower Gleason score. Those patients may be good candidates for active surveillance. I say maybe because really that's a determination that should be made on the patient level by their doctor. But the idea is if you meet these pretty strict criteria, that um, it's very likely that your prostate cancer would grow at a fairly regular and slow rate. And that therefore we could wait on instituting immediate treatment, which has side effects, in favor of delaying and kind of close surveillance with repeat PSAs, typically every six months to a year, a repeat biopsy, usually around a year to two years after the initial biopsy, sometimes even uh, regular MRI scans, um, and only if the cancer starts to progress do we intervene and actually offer active therapy. So again, I think this can be a great way to um, avoid side effects of treatment, um, and yet the chance that an opportunity for cure is missed, which is the big risk with active surveillance, is very, very low in appropriately selected patients. Okay, and what are some signs men should, should watch out for? Well, unfortunately, prostate cancer is a disease where it, um, if it presents with side effects, um, it's usually a very advanced cancer. Um, I think that, you know, uh, screening with PSA is the main way that prostate cancer is detected. And if you don't mind, we do have some screening guidelines we'll go ahead and put up on the screen here. Maybe you could kind of walk us through them. Uh, you, may you mentioned the PSA screening. What is PSA? What does that mean? So, so PSA stands for prostate-specific antigen. It's a, um, basically a, a protein byproduct that uh, is generated in the prostate. Uh, it's made by the regular prostate cells. It's also made by prostate.
greater quantities by prostate cancer than by the normal prostate. And so an elevated PSA can be a, a sign that someone may have prostate cancer, but it's not a perfect test. Um, but that has been the traditional way that most men have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. They undergo a screening PSA uh, or a digital rectal exam to feel for abnormalities in the prostate, and then that prompts a workup. Uh, whether with a biopsy or an MRI first and then a biopsy, but that's the usual process. So the guidelines for PSA screening have undergone a lot of changes over the last few years. It used to be very commonly done in middle-aged men. Now, um, I think the sort of current guidelines, as you can see on the screen there, show that if you're African-American, um, because that population is at slightly higher risk for prostate cancer, or you're a patient who has other risk factors such as family history, um, between the ages of 45 and 49, I think it's reasonable to discuss the potential benefits of screening with the patient. Now, patients may ask, well, um, why not just screen everyone? You know, why, why wouldn't I want to get screened? And I think that the answer is, while we can diagnose prostate cancer earlier with screening, we also subject a lot of men to additional tests, uh, additional anxiety associated with those tests, and biopsies, most of which are negative. And a certain percentage of men are going to develop, are going to have, no, have, have a negative prostate biopsy, but develop a serious infection as a result of the prostate biopsy. So there is a segment of men that we're actually harming, not intentionally, of course, by, um, by over-screening. And so I think that that was one of the reasons that the guidelines were changed, but I think we have to sort of balance that with the fact that if we aren't screening these patients, we're going to be detecting cancer once it's no longer in a curable stage. Now to get back to the guidelines, so if you're 50 and over, I think that again, there is some, some value in obtaining a PSA test, but that's something again where I think you should discuss um, the potential benefits and harms with your, with your doctor. Very good. And I would guess if you have any questions about any type of urologic cancers, you know, if, if we haven't answered them today, certainly a good place to start would be with your own physician as well. Of course. Um, so we were wondering, uh, we have a question here from, from another viewer, Bonnie, who's asking, what are the first signs of all urologic cancers? Is there a common symptom that, that might indicate it could be one of, of a number of urologic cancers? So there's really not one kind of common symptom that, that unifies them all. Um, I mean, I think some common symptoms would be pelvic pain. So I think any of the urologic cancers could present with pelvic discomfort. I think any of the urologic cancers could present with change in urination, whether discomfort with urination, blood in the urine. Um, those would be probably the most common things. Um, that, that can be sort of presenting symptoms. The other is, is sometimes a lump. So that's more relevant for testicular cancer. It's, it's rare that um, the other urologic cancers would present with a, a tumor, um, like, like with a mass that the patient could, could actually feel or notice. Very good. Uh, you mentioned testicular cancer, and, and obviously fertility preservation is something that's on the minds of, of a lot of patients. I'm wondering uh, is, if that's true with some of your patients in that in that situation. Of too. course, yeah. So, so um, quality of life, survivorship issues, and fertility are very important for testicular cancer patients. They tend to be younger men, very often men who have not yet started a family, but but want that option in the future. Um, and so um, going to sort of fertility counseling, uh, undergoing sperm banking, talking um, with their oncologists about uh, the pros and cons of different treatments and their impact on fertility is, is very important. Very good. Are there any sort of other sort of maybe, you know, secondary issues? I mean, obviously cancer is, is, is a very negative situation, but it's surrounded by a number of other issues as well. Um, are there any other common ones that, that your patients bring up and ask you about? You mean with related to the quality of life? Um, so I think, you know, a common one that we'll see in the world of prostate cancer is... Um, so issues surrounding uh, sort of urinary quality of life uh, and then erectile function. Um, so, you know, following radical prostatectomy, uh, you know, relatively small percentage of men are going to develop some urinary incontinence. Which and that's, can a, that's the surgery, correct? That's the surgery. Um, incontinence is much less common after radiation, but after radiation, men can sometimes experience more obstructive urinary symptoms. So weaker stream, peeing more often 
getting up more at night to pee, things like that. So um, we use certain medications to try to improve those symptoms. Those are often the same medications that men with enlarged prostates might be taking, like tamsulosin or finasteride, for instance. Um, as far as erectile dysfunction, you know, that is one of the reasons why a lot of men um, will favor active surveillance if they have a cancer that is amenable to that because active surveillance is associated with the best rates of preserved potency for men. Um, I think there have been great strides made uh, on both the surgery and the radiation side in improving um, uh, so preservation of erectile function. So the surgeons uh, will try to do nerve sparing uh, radical prostatectomies to, to limit damage to the nerve, which can affect erections and radiation oncology. Um, we have really improved our targeting of the tumor and our radiation therapy plans are much more robust. We can deliver a high dose with a much more rapid fall off with much greater accuracy than we could in the past. And there's been much greater awareness of the importance of minimizing dose to some of those organs to try to improve erectile function. And I think we do a really good job of that here at WashU, both on the surgery side and the radiation side. Um, but erectile dysfunction issues come up. It, it's unfortunately part of the aging process. Um, and we'll usually do a trial of, of one of the sort of erectile dysfunction medications. Um, you know, uh, sildenafil being a very common one. Um, and if the patient doesn't respond to that, then I'll typically refer them back to my urology colleagues like Dr. Andrew uh, for a discussion about other options. But because there are options. So if, if, if a man uh, is impotent following oncologic treatment, there are, there are ways to, to improve that situation. And it really speaks again to that kind of multidisciplinary approach where you have multiple experts looking at the same problem, maybe through slightly different lenses to really craft the, the right treatment plan Absolutely. in partnership with the patient. Sure. Um, I kind of wanted to touch on, again, a couple of the other urologic cancers and maybe some advances that you're aware of with sure. bladder cancer or, or one of the other ones. Um, what do you think are some of the more noteworthy things to mention there? Um, well, so I think one uh, area of focus that's my particular sort of research interest with respect to bladder cancer is um, the use of some adjuvant therapies and with bladder cancer. Which means? So that means uh, treatments given following surgery. So the most common treatment for um, muscle invasive bladder cancer in this country is complete removal of the bladder. And that is a, a very involved surgery. It's, it's one of the most uh, involved and extensive surgeries in all of oncology because it involves uh, not only rerouting of the patient's urine, but to create um, a reservoir to hold that urine, uh, usually segments of bowel are recruited um, and taken out of the line, so to speak, a lot of to, to create. So there's a lot of reconstruction, and the surgery is happening in patients who are older and usually uh, lifelong smokers, so they have other medical issues. Um, chemotherapy given before surgery is a very common treatment, but for patients with more advanced tumors at the time of surgery, the likelihood that the cancer is going to come back somewhere on the pelvis is unfortunately quite high, on the realm of 30%. And that risk is, has not been shown to be reduced by the addition of chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is great for reducing the risk of distant metastasis. But it turns out in bladder cancer, it's not very effective at preventing disease in the pelvis from recurring. So. Um, one of my research collaborators uh, in Egypt, um, Dr. Mohamed Zagul, uh, has a, did a trial um, that I've sort of helped him to analyze where he looked at patients who received um, surgery for their, for their in, in invasive bladder cancer and they also received um, either chemotherapy and radiation following surgery or just um, radiation or chemotherapy alone. And what he found is that the um, addition of chemotherapy and radiation um, provided benefit and that we were actually able to improve overall survival in patients who got both of those treatments. And in this country, radiation um, doesn't really have much of a role yet. It's, it's increasingly being used more commonly. The NCCN National Cancer Guidelines now support its use in large part based on, on this, this study. Um, but I think that for bladder cancer, if you have locally advanced disease, 
um, post-operative radiation can significantly reduce that chance. So instead of having a 30% chance of the cancer coming back in the pelvis, your chance drops to about 5%. So in the oncology world, that's a huge benefit. Yeah, and, and I guess it also speaks kind of to one of the other strong points of, of working uh, being treated at an academic medical center, is, and that is you're often being treated by not only physicians, but who are, they're also researchers themselves. They may be in contact with researchers around the world, as you just mentioned, and again, they work, you work together in that multidisciplinary approach uh, where there are multiple people looking at the problem at the same time. Absolutely, yeah, and I think that's really uh, a strong advantage of, of coming to WashU. We are very specialized. We do work in a multidisciplinary fashion. Very good. Well, Dr. Bauman, I think we've run out of time, and we certainly appreciate you uh, filling in not only for yourself, but Dr. Andriel, who wasn't My able pleasure. to make it after all. Um, and we want to thank our viewers as well for joining us today about this discussion of urologic cancer treatment and the screening. Uh, we invite you to uh, check out our web. Uh, website, which is siteman.wustl.edu, and certainly please continue to follow our Facebook page for about information of future Facebook Live events. Thank you for joining us.